So today we're going to be looking be looking at the three main types of blood vessels in the human body. And we're going to look at the differences in its form. When we talk about form, we're talking about its structure. So we're going to look at how they're structurally different, and then we're going to look at how they're functionally different. Now, we have three different blood vessels for a reason. If all the blood vessels have the same job, then we'll just have one blood vessel. But we have three different blood vessels for a reason because each different type has its own job to do or its own function. Therefore, we need three. So we have three different types of blood vessels, and we're going to look at them and see how their structure is related to their function or their job, what they are designed to do. So today, our objective, we're going to differentiate the three types of blood vessels, and then we're going to explain the form, meaning the structure, and the function of each type of blood vessel. So as you should recall, in your blood vessel, you have blood. This is how blood is transported around the body, through these blood vessels. And what you have to realize is the blood vessels are all connected to each other. It's a closed system. So blood isn't just leaking all through your body cavities. It is enclosed in this closed system, and it circulates around the body through these blood vessels. So blood circulates the human body in a network of blood vessels, and we have three types, like I mentioned before. We have our arteries, we have our veins, and then we have our capillaries. Now, each type of blood vessel, we're going to look at its structure, and then we're going to look at its job, and see how the structure of the blood vessel allows it to carry out its very important job. So there are three types. We have our capillaries, we have our arteries, and we have our stain. So the structure of each blood vessel, like I said, is, meant, is related to its function. It's directly related to its, its function. So the way it's designed actually allows it to carry out its job. Now we talk about the three main or three major blood vessels, but these blood vessels, they branch off into smaller blood vessels. So our arteries will branch off into smaller blood vessels called arterioles, our veins are going to branch off into what are called venules. And our arterioles and our venules meet together at the very, very smallest blood vessels that we call capillaries. So now we're going to get into arteries, then we're going to talk about veins, and then we'll talk about our capillaries. Now here I have um, three items on your screen. You have a big heavy-duty tire, you have a bicycle tire, and then you have a balloon. And I'm going to ask you the, the very obvious question. Which one of these objects do you think can handle the greatest amount of pressure? They all hold air. But which one of these do you think can handle the greatest amount of pressure? And then not just handle it, you have to tell me why. Why do you think that all of these objects hold air, but they all handle different levels of pressure of air? Yes, the heavy-duty tire. You're right. The heavy-duty tire, for obvious reasons, can handle more pressure than, let's say, the balloon or even the bicycle tire. Why do you think? I see Dwayne Cauley said, because it has a thicker lining. That is true. It is bigger. Well, bigger in this case doesn't necessarily mean stronger. But the thickness of the lining does play a role in how much pressure these objects can, can take. So our balloon, we know it, it's very, very thin when you compare it to the thickness of the bicycle tire or even more the thickness of the heavy-duty tire, the thinness of the membrane. So we have a thick membrane in the heavy-duty tire. We have a thinner membrane in the bicycle tire. And then when we look at the balloon, it is very, very thin. So the thinness or the thickness will determine how much pressure it is designed to carry. So that takes us into arteries. So when we talk about arteries, the main function of the arteries or the arterioles, they are, they're designed to carry blood away from the heart and not just carry blood away from the heart, but carry blood that is under very, very high pressure. When blood is being pumped out of the heart, it has to circulate the entire body from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Every part of your body needs to be supplied with blood. So the arteries are designed to 
withstand very, very high pressure. So when we refer back to our diagrams of our tires, which tire do you think closely resembles or has basically the same function of the artery? Which tire would you compare to the artery? Okay, I have in some conflicting answers. Some of you are saying the heavy duty one. A few of you are saying the bicycle tire. Hmm, why the bicycle tire? Can you see, do you feel as though the bicycle tire can withstand as much pressure as the heavy duty tire? Think about it. No, that heavy duty tire is designed to withstand the greatest amount of pressure when we look at those three objects. And the arteries are actually designed to withstand the greatest amount of pressure. So when we talk about our blood vessels and which one is most designed to, high, to, to work best under high pressure, it would be our arteries. And we're gonna look at that when we look at its structure. So right now, its function basically is to transport blood that is under very high pressure away from the heart and deliver it to all the cells of the body. Not only does it carry blood that's under high pressure, in most instances, the blood that it's delivering is blood that is very rich in oxygen and has nutrients. So we have one exception that we'll talk about later, but right now you need to know that arteries can withstand very, very high pressure because of the structure and its function is to deliver blood to all parts of the body. And this is blood that's being pumped directly from the heart. So let's, let's look at its structure. Arteries have very, very strong muscular walls, very strong muscular walls. And if you look very closely at our diagram, we see that the wall is several layers thick. There are different types of tissue that makes up this muscular wall. So the muscular walls are very thick. They're much thicker than veins that we're going to talk about next. And they have a very, in comparison to the vein, it has a more narrow lumen. Now the lumen would be this section at the middle or at the center of blood vessels. And this is where blood flows. So this space called the lumen will actually be filled with blood had this blood vessel been a living blood vessel. So the lumen size is very narrow this narrowness also contributes to increasing pressure because if you have a smaller space, but you have a large volume of something that you want to fit through the smaller space, it's going to come out and move through very, very quickly. What is also very important about the arteries is that the wall, the muscular wall has elastic fibers in it. And if you know anything about elastic, elastic allows things to expand or stretch. And not only does it stretch, but it also goes back to its original shape. So our muscular walls in our arteries are able to expand and then relax, expand and relax. And this helps to accommodate blood that is traveling through it under very high pressure. So it has this ability to expand, thereby not causing them to rupture or burst under high pressure. So here we have a closer look at our arteries. We're looking at the thickness of its wall. So here we see the wall is very, very thick. Our lumen is relatively narrow, and we're gonna see that more when we start to compare it with the vein. So here our lumen is pretty narrow, but our walls are very, very thick. The innermost lining of the artery is lined with a special layer of tissue called epithelial cells. And if you know anything but epithelial cells, epithelial cells is what we call skin cells. So the inner lining of our arteries are also lined with skin cells, the endo, endothelium, which is epithelial cells, and this adds a layer of protection. Just like how your outer skin protects your body and controls what can enter and leave, this endothelium does basically the same thing, lining the inside of your arteries. And here in this diagram, you see it's one layer of cells, the endothelium, which are epithelial cells or skin cells. Here we have our elastic layer, allowing our artery to contract and expand. And then we have our smooth muscle layer and our artery wall, I wanna emphasize, is very, very thick in comparison. And this thickness allows it to carry out its very important function. So now we're gonna look at how our arteries 
Their form, meaning their structure, is directly related to their function, what they do. So the thick walls of the artery allows the vessels to withstand very high pressure of blood running through it, just like our heavy-duty tire. Our heavy-duty tire can withstand the weight or the pressure of an enormous truck that rests, rests on top of it, on top of its frame. You can't imagine resting even a car on top of a balloon and expect it to work because the balloon is not designed to carry so much pressure. But these heavy-duty tires are designed to withstand a lot of pressure or weight pushing down on it. So our arteries are almost like, think about it in that sense. It's designed, the thickness allows it to withstand a whole lot of pressure. Arteries also, the elastic fibers allow them to recoil or retract and expand as blood passes through them. This also helps to force blood through, but it also helps to dampen the vibration. You really can feel your blood moving through your body. So the elastic fibers allows the blood to be forced through your arteries. And again, the smaller lumen. So the small lumen is by design, and the smaller lumen also allows for this blood traveling through the arteries to maintain its high pressure. So the lumen narrowness is also a very important feature and it allows blood to maintain its high pressure as it travels through the blood vessel. So that's it for arteries. We now see how our arteries, the structure of the artery, allows it to carry out its function. Okay, so now we move on to our veins. Our veins, if you haven't figured it out by now, would be similar to our bicycle tire. Still can withstand uh, 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 some pressure, but definitely cannot withstand the same amount of pressure as our heavy duty tire. So our function of our veins. Our veins are responsible for carrying or returning blood to the heart. The blood that's being returned to the heart is deoxygenated blood or blood that has very little oxygen in it. It's not absent of oxygen, but it just has very little oxygen in it. So our veins return this deoxygenated blood back to our heart. Again, there's an exception with our pulmonary vein. When we consider veins, we say vein carry, veins will carry deoxygenated blood. But in the case of our pulmonary vein, actually the blood in that one vein is actually oxygenated blood. But it holds true to the fact that veins return blood to the heart. Our pulmonary vein is that one vein that returns oxygen-rich blood back to the heart after that blood would have circulated past the lung. So our veins, like our arteries, also have a muscular wall. But the muscular wall is not as thick as our, our arteries or arterioles. The walls are not elastic, as in the arteries. So here we already have two differences. So our walls are not as thick, and they don't have elastic tissue in it as our arteries do. However, the lumen, or that space through which blood travels through, is actually a lot wider in your vein than it is in your arteries. Now this is one interesting structure that sets veins apart from arteries, in that veins have these things called valves. Valves open and close. Your faucet in your bathroom or in your kitchen, when you turn on your faucet and water comes through, you're actually opening a valve. When you turn off your faucet and water stops flowing, you're actually closing a valve. So the valves in your veins work in almost the same fashion in that it opens and closes. So when it opens, obviously, blood will be able to pass through. And when it closes, it stops blood from passing through. Our valves in our veins have a very important job to do in that they ensure that blood will continue to move in one direction. The blood in your veins is in comparison under lower pressure than the blood that's in your arteries. So having these valves there to prevent blood from flowing backwards is very important. Our veins are usually found um, deep between our skeletal muscles and where it's located also helps in allowing blood to flow through and to maintain that one directional flow. So let's look at our structure.
The walls of our veins, again, if you remember the picture from my artery, and I'm going to have a slide where I have them side by side. The veins are, are, have a very thinner muscular wall. They do also still have that endothelium or epithelium cilia lining, again, that skin layer that protects it, offers some protection. And our lumen, if we look at it, is very, very wide. So because the wideness of the space, blood has more space to travel through, so the pressure will be less. So let's look at how form matches up with function. So the wide lumen. The wide lumen allows easy flow of blood. Again, though, keeping in mind that this blood is under low pressure. So our, our valves are going to play a very important role. So wide lumen, easy flow of blood. Surrounding skeletal muscle, again, helps to con when the muscles relax and contract, they also help to push the blood along in your veins. So our surrounding skeletal muscles contract, they help to push blood along in the veins. And again, this helps in the one direction or the unidirectional flow of blood. Valves. The valves in the wall help the blood that is under low pressure to continue moving in just one direction. So these valves, which you only will find in your veins and not in your arteries and not in your capillaries, help to maintain that one direction flow of blood and prevent blood from flowing backwards. Remember, blood is circulating the entire body, and it has to make its way back to the heart. Even the blood in your big toe has to make its way all the way back up to your heart. It's a very long way away, and it's an uphill battle. So these valves help to maintain that one directional flow. So again, here's another diagram of your vein, showing you the very large lumen, the thinner, relatively thinner muscular wall and our layer of epithelial tissue. So when we look at them, can you tell which is which? Which does A represent? Which blood vessel is A? If you were just remember our activity at the beginning where we were trying to spot the difference, it's the same thing. You're trying to spot the difference. So in which these two diagrams, which is which? Who can tell me which is A? Okay. I want, very good, quite a few of you are telling me that A is the artery, and you are correct, but now you have to give me one reason why you chose A to be the artery. What is your reason? Prove it. Why are you telling me it's A? What in this diagram makes you believe that A is an artery? Good. The thick layer, very good. Now, you can tell that the walls are strong. You can tell by just looking at it. So saying strong walls would not be considered a correct answer. Thick, very good. Narrow lumen, very good. Very good. I saw somebody told me that it's one cell thick, and that is not right. That is incorrect. It has, very, it has several layers of tissue. And if you remember anything about tissues, tissue are made up of cells. So this tells you that we have several layers of cells. Very good. So we have a thick wall, and then we have a small lumen. So then we now know that B has to be our vein. Now prove to me why B is considered the vein. Yes, it does have a wider lumen, very good, wide lumen. And it has a thinner, no, it's not one cell thick. It's not one cell thick. There are several layers of tissue. If, if a structure has several layers of tissue, it's not one cell thick. Because if it's one cell thick, then it's no tissue, okay? So it has layers of tissue, but the thickness of the tissue is not as thick as that as of the artery. So it has thinner layer of tissue, okay, or thinner wall. Very good. So before we move on and start to discuss our capillaries, I just want you to take note that the largest artery in the human body is the aorta. This is the artery that carries blood away from the heart, okay? So it's the largest artery in the body. And as we mentioned earlier, as arteries travel through the body, they tend to get smaller and smaller, and we have large arteries, and then we have smaller arterioles. 
And again, they are still designed to withstand large, large amounts of pressure. Also, the largest vein in the body is known as the vena cava. Now we have two vena cava. We have the superior vena cava, and then we have the inferior vena cava. Now, anytime you think about superior, you think about up there, right? So our superior vena cava is the vena cava that returns blood to the heart, but it's the one above the inferior vena cava, and it returns blood to the heart that is coming from the upper part of the body. So any part of the body that's above the heart, blood will drain back to the heart through the superior vena cava, and all the blood returning from below the heart or below the lower part of the body will return to the heart through the inferior vena cava. So the vena cava is the largest vein in the body and the aorta is the largest artery in the body. And both of them connect directly to the heart. So now we move on to capillaries. So the arteries do all the rough work. They make sure blood gets to where it needs to go. Veins, Hmm. They do some work, but you know, it's, the difference is, you know, rushing to work in the morning and then driving back at home in the evening is a different level of stress. So the arteries, they do all the grunt work, the veins, they carry blood, they return the blood. You know, by this time, the blood is under lower pressure. But the capillaries, the capillaries actually, uh, the most important, I feel, blood vessels. It's the smallest one too. The smallest being the most important. And that's just my opinion. So here we have it. The capillaries are in direct contact with every cell and tissue in your body. Every cell and tissue. Now, when I'm in my classroom and I'm teaching this lesson, I always try to drive home to my students. Remember, every cell in your body is a living thing. If every cell in your body is a living thing, then every cell in your body needs oxygen and every cell in your body needs nutrients. And then, of course, it needs a way to get rid of waste. So think about it. Our capillaries are responsible for ensuring that every single of the trillions of billion cells in your body get oxygen, get nutrients, and can get rid of its waste. So these capillaries are very, very small because they have an intimate or direct relationship with the cells in your body that are also very, very small. So we have millions of networks of capillaries that are delivering nutrients and oxygen to every cell of the body and receiving waste products from those cells. So our capillaries, because they are very, very small, they have to be very, very small in order for it to carry out its function. Remember, we're talking about how the structure allows it to carry out its job or its function. So let's look at the function of capillaries. Capillaries are in direct contact with all the cells and tissues of the body for reasons I just explained. Blood cells, meaning your red blood cells and white blood cells, when they get down to the capillary level of blood vessels, those blood vessels are so small that these already microscopic cells have to, can only file through these blood vessels single file, meaning one behind the other. So here you have this microscopic cell flowing through this microscopic tube. So this should give you an idea of just how small capillaries are. Capillaries are very important because they are the site of exchange of substances. When substances enter or leave the capillaries, we call this diffusion. So here we have substances needed by the cells being transported to the cells by the capillaries. So at the capillary level, at this very, very small blood vessel that's in very, very close contact with all the cells of the body, you have oxygen leaving the bloodstream and entering the cells. You have carbon dioxide leaving the cells and entering the bloodstream. And I'm going to ask you, why do you think the cells are getting rid of its carbon dioxide and placing it into the bloodstream? I'm going to sit and wait for 
an answer. Why do we need to get this carbon dioxide into this bloodstream? Can anybody tell me? I'm still waiting on an answer. Okay, so it can leave the body, but how is it going to leave the body? Okay, I'm seeing variety. I see variety of answers. Good. Yes. We want carbon dioxide to exit our bodies. And guess what? When this carbon dioxide leaves the cell, enter our bloodstream through the capillaries, that blood that's in the capillaries are, is eventually going to enter our veins. And once it enters our veins, the veins are going to make sure that blood gets back to the heart, and the heart is going to pump that same blood to the lungs. Once that blood is pumped to the lungs, the lungs are now responsible for releasing it, or we exhale it from our body. So yes, that is why. So it can be excreted, and it's excreted from our body through our lungs. Very good. So let's move on. So let's look at the structure of our capillaries. Just like the other two blood vessels we looked at, we saw that the structure allowed it to carry out its job. And it's no different with the capillary. Now, since the capillary is responsible for exchange of substances, that means those substances have to be able to easily leave the capillary. Or substances have to be easily enter the capillary. And what makes this easy is the, there are no muscles in the wall of the capillaries, and the capillaries don't even have quote-unquote walls per se, because they're only one cell thick. Imagine, it's easier, and this, I usually give this example to my students when I'm in the classroom. Here's a book that's several layers thick. Here's a sheet of paper that's one layer thick. What do you think? Which one of these do you think is easier to get something through? This book that's several layers thick or this sheet of paper that's one layer thick? And the answer is obvious. The one, the paper, of course. Just like the capillaries, it's only one layer thick. So it's easy for substances to diffuse into the bloodstream or leave the bloodstream and enter a cell. Again, a cell is only one layer thick. So it makes it easy for the exchange of substances. And I saw somebody mentioned earlier, yes, so yes, the capillary is like the balloon. Very thin, only one layer thick, can't take too much pressure. It is so, so small that blood can only flow through, or blood cells can only flow, flow through it in single file. So that tells you the size of it, and that tells you how much pressure that it can actually take. And Capillaries are the most abundant blood vessel. Duh. Remember I said it has to supply those trillions of cells in the body. So it makes sense that we have more capillaries than any other blood vessel. So let's look at our structure of our capillary. In this diagram, we can see that this layer right here, which is an epithelial cell layer, is only one cell. So it's very thin. There are no layers of tissue. There's no elastic fiber. It's just one single cell that has a lumen. And the lumen is so narrow that blood cells can only pass through one at a time. So capillaries are the smallest of all blood vessels. The diagram at the bottom, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But it's showing you that nutrients leave the capillary. Oxygen leaves the capillary and enters the cells of the body. And at the same time, waste products, carbon dioxide and other waste products will leave the cells of the body and enter the capillary or the bloodstream so that that body can now figure out or send our waste products in the correct direction to get rid of it properly, okay? So let's look at how form matches up with function. Blood cells. Red blood cells, white blood cells flow in single file in the lumen of the capillary. And here we have, we can see a capillary that has oxygenated blood and a capillary that has deoxygenated blood. How did I know the difference? Who can tell me how I came to that conclusion? That I have two capillaries, but one has oxygenated blood and one I'm figuring has deoxygenated blood. How do I know the difference? Okay. So somebody he said the color, but what about the color? Tell me. Be more specific. Okay. Somebody said the one that is red has a lot of oxygen. And you are correct. Okay. 
So the capillary that is bright red will be that capillary that's delivering to the cell. And the other capillary that is purplish in color will be that one that is now removing or returning waste products away from the cell. And that purplish one is now going to reconnect to a venule that will reconnect to a vein that will eventually return blood to the heart. Very good. Thin walls. Now we talked about the thinness of the walls and why it's so important. The thinness of the walls allow for the easy transfer or diffusion of substances into and out of the blood vessel. So the thinness of the wall is very, very important. We don't have things diffusing or substances diffusing out of our arteries and our veins because the walls are so thick. It's several layers of tissue. So it's very difficult for oxygen or nutrients to diffuse out of those blood vessels and supply the cells with anything. So we need our capillaries because of its thinness of its walls, it's easy for substances to enter the bloodstream or leave the bloodstream. Again, another thing, the slow flow of blood in our capillaries, again, allows for easy diffusion of substances. And when we talk about diffusion, we're talking about the movement of substances into the bloodstream or out of the bloodstream and into the cells, surrounding cells around them. Again, our diagram shows that the blood cells are moving through in single file. So again, it shows you that the lumen is very, very narrow. And the slow flow of blood also tells you that capillaries can't withstand much pressure. So it's a very slower moving blood once you get to the capillary. So the pressure is also very low. Okay, so we reached the end of it, really. So now let's compare. Let's look at all of them. Okay, let's look at them all. So here we have side by side. Our arteries, our thick walls, our narrow lumen, our veins, our thinner walls, wider lumen, our capillaries, one cell thick, very, very small. When we look at our arteries, the lumen is filled with blood and blood cells rushing through. When we look at our veins, the same thing. We have a large volume of blood that's rushing through at the same time. But when we now look at our capillaries, remember, our blood cells can only move through one at a time. So we have a, a, a lower volume of blood moving through our capillaries at a slower pace. Again, just another view. Here we have our arteries and we see that the walls are several layers thick. Again, our veins as well, several layers thick of, of tissue. And our capillary, just one single cell layer, very thin wall. And if we were to look at our arteries and veins under a microscope, this is what they will look like. So our veins and our arteries are relatively, if we look at the actual size of them, they're relatively the same size. But the way we tell the difference is we look at the size of the lumen, which would be this white space in here. Here we have a narrow lumen. Here we have a wide lumen. And this vein right here is squished a little bit. Remember, our veins are embedded in our skeletal muscle. And then we have a very, very thick wall. All of this represents the thickness of the arteries, muscular wall, and our veins. If we look at it, the wall is not as thick. And we can't even see the capillary. They're that small. Again, another view, our thick wall, Thinner wall, wider lumen of our vein, much narrow lumen of our artery, and our capillary, again, only one cell thick, very, very small. And again, another view. You know, it's just to show you that every diagram you look at may be slightly different, but if you remember to spot the differences, you will always be able to tell which one is which. Because now you know our arteries have thick muscular walls, but it has a narrow lumen. Our veins have a thinner muscular wall and a wider lumen. And when we look at our capillaries, we know we have one layer of cells, so we don't, even have a, we don't even have a layer of tissue. So we now know, no matter what our diagram looks like, we should be able to spot the difference. Remember our exercise at the beginning, spot the difference? 
you should now be able to spot the difference. Now, all of them do not deliver blood to the heart. The only blood vessel that returns blood to the heart would be the vein. Our arteries push blood away from the heart. Our capillaries deliver substances to all of the cells of the body and our veins return blood to the heart. So let's, we have a checkpoint, okay? And we're gonna work through it together. We're gonna see how we can work on it together. So here now, we have three blood vessels. You have to first identify each blood vessel and then you are to assign the function to the blood vessel, to the correct blood vessel. So I need somebody first to tell me, which blood vessel is A? Okay, very good. I see a lot of people telling me that A is the artery. Now you have, need to give me, so before we even get to the bottom where we have our descriptors, why do you say A? Somebody needs to tell me, what about A gave it away? There are several things in that diagram, but what about A gave it away? Okay, and don't say small. Remember, we use the word narrow or wide. So we have a narrow lumen, very good. Thick wall, very good. Okay, a thick layer. Does anybody see that arrow? Do you see that arrow? Sebastian, you're not trying hard enough for me. <laughs> you do know Sebastian. Okay, right. That arrow is showing you that whatever is in that lumen is being pushed away. So that indicates that it's going away from the heart. Very good. And we know that our arteries are responsible for carrying blood away from the heart. Very good. So that arrow is also a helpful clue in telling us that A must be an artery. Very good. So what is B? Okay. Laura, you told me it's a vein. Tell me, Laura, why do you say it's a vein? Many of you are saying capillary. Very good. Now you need to tell me, give me a reason. Why do you say capillary? What about it gave it away? No wall. Capillaries don't have walls. One cell thick. Very good. It is just one cell thick. No walls. It is one cell thick. And the, the center of it or the lumen is very, very, very narrow. Very good. Very good. So that now leaves us with C. C has to be the vein, but you're not going to get away that easy. What about that diagram tells you that that's the vein? Okay, very good. Somebody noticed the valve, very good. It has thinner walls, very good. Carries blood to the heart. So now you realize that arrow is telling you that it's directing blood towards the heart. Very good, very, very good. So now we can move on and we can now place our descriptors in the right column. So we're gonna do this together. And now you're just going to tell me A, B, or C. So I'll read off the descriptor, and you tell me which one it belongs to, A, B, or C. So it's a medium-sized blood vessel. Is it A, B, or C? Yes, it's C. Very good. It is C, okay? It is C. A would be considered the largest blood vessels in the body. The arteries would be considered the largest blood vessels in the body. So medium-sized, yes. C would be medium size, so that is our vein. Very good. Walls are only one cell thick. Very good. C, our capillaries. We know the walls are only one cell thick. Awesome. Tough, flexible, and thick walls. Very good. Our arteries are tough because they have to withstand all that pressure. They have those thick, flexible, elastic walls. Very good. Exchanges oxygen. I can't see what the rest says because I have your chat in front of it. What does it say? Exchanges oxygen and waste with the blood. Which one of these blood vessels exchanges oxygen and waste with the blood? Okay, okay. I have a mixture of answers. I have a whole mixture of answers. All right. The correct answer would be B. Remember, the thin walls of the capillary, the thin walls of the capillary allow things to easily leave or enter the blood vessel. Remember, substances can enter through a thick wall. So we have a thick walled artery, we have a thick walled vein, but we have only have a one single layer 
capillary. So it's easier for substances to come into the capillary. So when we talk about exchanges of oxygen and nutrients or waste, it will always happen at the capillary. Again, because the capillary has a very, very thin wall. So it's easy for substances to pass through. The arteries and veins have a very thick wall, so it makes it more difficult. You see all these layers that have to pass through? It will never pass through. So arteries and veins, you won't have substances being exchanged there. When we talk about exchange of substances, we mean that the substances are actually leaving the blood and entering something else. We have our nutrients. Our nutrients are usually transported through our bloodstream. So once we eat our food, our food is digested, the nutrients enter our bloodstream, and then our bloodstream transports the nutrients to all the cells of the body that's waiting on that nutrient so it can carry out its function. So when we talk about substances entering or leaving the blood, the only way it can enter or leave the blood will be through the capillary, which is B. Okay, so B, which is the smallest blood vessel? Very good. B is our smallest blood vessel, B. Because again, it's one cell thick. It's so small that blood cells can only pass through it one by one. And blood cells are microscopic. So capillaries are our smallest blood vessel. Carries blood back to the heart. Carries blood back to the heart. Very good. C, our veins responsible for carrying blood back to the heart. Valves help this low pressure blood not flow backwards. Very good. Muscular non-elastic wall. Which one has the muscular law? Very good. See, our veins. The walls are muscular, but they don't have as much elastic tissue as our arteries. Very good. Largest blood vessel. Largest blood vessel. A. Okay. Our arteries are considered our largest blood vessels. And finally, carries blood away from the heart. Which one of these carry our blood away from the heart? Very good. A, our arteries are responsible for transporting blood away from the heart. So here we have all of our answers. Arteries, largest blood vessel, tough, flexible, thick wall, carries blood away from the heart. Our capillary, which is our smallest blood vessel, only one cell thick, and this, is, this allows it to exchange substances with the surrounding cells. And then finally, we have our veins, which are considered the medium-sized blood vessel. They have muscular non-elastic walls and carries blood back to the heart. Okay? So there we have it, our three blood vessels. And I hope now that all of you can spot the difference. And that brings us to the end of our PowerPoint. Now, the blood vessel, somebody asks, what is responsible for the colors of the blood vessel? Now, when we look at blood under a microscope or blood vessels, usually our veins have a blue tinge to it or a bluish color to it because the blood that's normally in the veins has a very low concentration of oxygen, okay? When blood is infused with oxygen and those red blood cells have a lot of oxygen attached to it, they tend to be very bright red. So when we see arteries, arteries are usually illustrated as being red because they are responsible for carrying oxygenated blood around the body. And when we see blue, we think of veins because veins now will be returning deoxygenated or oxygen poor blood back to the heart. So oxygen rich blood usually looks bright red and oxygen poor blood usually looks purplish or bluish in color. You know, if somebody uh, who's very fair in color, if they don't get oxygen, they kind of turn blue as well, okay? So when, when our blood has very little oxygen in it, it looks bluish. Okay, I am going to share a file with the notes for you. I'm going to have the link, have the file posted on the portal, and then you can download or save a copy of it on your device, okay? So I do have a, a note sheet. Okay, guys, thank you so much for signing in today.